It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. These are the opening lines of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Most people consider it the greatest of his novels. The time of which he's speaking is uh, the period leading directly up to the French Revolution. And it was indeed a unique time. Uh, this period was at the end of an age which historians today call the Age of Reason or the Age of Enlightenment. It included uh, figures like Isaac Newton and René Descartes and um, Immanuel Kant and David Hume and uh, Locke and Voltaire and Rousseau and Hobbes and Adam Smith, all of these great thinkers. To say that there were um, advances in science and mathematics during this time wouldn't be fair at all. Uh, most of these things were invented during this time. Newton invented the calculus and physics and uh, uh, Adam Smith invented modern economics and politics was in, in the uh, process of being transformed as well. But amidst this backdrop of tremendous uh, human progress, um, we hear a story from Dickens about um, class warfare, uh, about how the uh, poor are being oppressed and downtrodden by the very, very rich, how royalty and the whims of royalty uh, cast people in prison or have them executed. So it, it, it's a time of both great turmoil and very rich progress. In the novel, uh, Dickens tells a story uh, that is a story of hope in a lot of ways. And in fact, one could say that Dickens wrote the book to celebrate a moment in history in which he believed that Europe itself was being reborn. It's a time, he says, very much like the time in which he was living and writing, and perhaps a time like the time we live in, too. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. If that saying could apply to the years leading up to the French Revolution or uh, to Dickens' own life, it could much more easily apply to the times of Ezekiel the prophet. Ezekiel lived in a period right around what we call the Babylonian exile. Um, his ministry began in the midst of that exile, in fact. It uh, begins with a wonderful scene at the beginning of the book where God's glory is described as Ezekiel saw it. Uh, God himself seated on the throne of a sort of a celestial chariot. The uh, poetic vision is absolutely stupendous. He, Ezekiel has this experience of God's physical presence in his life, calling him and telling him, I have a message for you to give to the people, and you're going to be like my watchman, he says. I'm going to give you this message, and if you don't deliver it, then you're responsible for whatever happens to the people. It doesn't matter if they listen or not. You have to give this word to them. And he begins to speak to Ezekiel. And he doesn't have much good to say. He predicts that uh, the Babylonians will again uh, invade Israel, and this time they will tear down the city of Jerusalem and they'll tear down the temple. And, and he 
uh, portrays this truth in all kinds of strange ways. He builds a clay model of the city and beats on it with a sword. He shaves off his hair and he burns it in three different stacks to symbolize different stages of the conquest. He talks about uh, Israel and their rebellion. Um, the word that God gives Ezekiel is, yes, all of these terrible things are going to happen. And it's our own fault, Ezekiel says. We, we failed to keep the Sabbaths. Um, we became idolatrous in our own land. We had idolatry, if not on our own altars, at least in our hearts. We rebelled against God, and, and the pictures of rebellion that Ezekiel drew are like a vine that's been carefully tended and then fails to bear fruit, or even more poignant, like um, a young girl who is rescued from poverty and groomed for marriage, and then cheats on her husband. Ezekiel calls Israel a nation of prostitutes. And, and he, he says to the people there in the exile, this is going to get worse. For 25 chapters, he spills out this vision of gloom and doom and recrimination. And, and then he takes a breath and he spends another 10 chapters speaking judgment on the nations that surrounded Israel and doom. It was the worst of times. Finally, Ezekiel sees a climactic vision that's the most frightening of all. It's not just the destruction of the temple, not just a few walls being torn down, not just people being carted off into slavery. He sees the same vision of the glory of the Lord that had been present at his calling. Rising up from the temple, leaving the temple and going to the gates of the city, and going on out into the wilderness. He envisions God physically leaving his children. It's around this time that Ezekiel's own wife dies, and God speaks to him, and he says, don't have a funeral. Don't cry for her. Do none of the things that husbands do when they lose their wives, and when people ask you, tell them, this is how I feel about my bride. This is how I feel about the people of Israel. She goes to her judgment and I shed not a tear. I'm, I'm done with you. These days of exile, in addition to being the setting of Ezekiel's ministry, are also the setting for Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks.
this psalm with its hopelessness, uh, the preaching of Ezekiel for the first 35 chapters of the book that bears his name is also bleak. And then in chapter 36, the tone changes completely. God begins to uh, ask different sorts of things to Ezekiel. He says, I, I want you to prophesy to the mountains and tell them that uh, their years of barrenness won't last forever and that one day soon there will be crops growing there on the mountainsides again and people moving about their business of daily life. And then he comes to chapter 37, which is probably the story, if people know only one story from the book of Ezekiel, it's probably this one in chapter 37, when the Holy Spirit lifts Ezekiel up, takes him out into a dry parched land filled with dry bones. And as Ezekiel moves through this landscape, God speaks a word to him. He says, Son of man, can these bones live? And, and Ezekiel's answer, he, he says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that answer. Um, I, I would expect a yes from our heroes of faith, our biblical prophets. And we get something different, don't we? It's, it's not a yes. It, it's not a no either. It, it's a, I, I'm not sure. And, and maybe we could just say, okay, even the greatest of spirits sometimes go through times of uncertainty and just receive that lesson. But you alone know, Sovereign Lord, was Ezekiel's answer, and I wonder... I wonder if he maybe understands what's going on in this moment a little bit better than we do. We usually think of the question as being, does God have the power to raise the dead? Does he have uh, the power to give eternal life? Does he have the power uh, to give us life after death and take us to heaven? But Ezekiel understands the symbolism of these dry bones and the symbolism of the resurrection in a very different way as he explains to us later in the passage. This is not just about what happens after we die. This is about hope in the present moment. And God's question to Ezekiel really is, do you think I can restore these people? After all they've done, do you think I can untangle the mess that my people have made through their sinfulness and rebellion? Do you think I can do all the damage that they've done to our relationship? And, and so Ezekiel gives a very honest answer. I, I'm not sure. And it's not that he doesn't believe in the sovereignty of God or the power of God. He's been preaching it from the beginning of the book. But now the question is different, isn't it? It's not just about what he believes God can do. It's about what he believes that the people of God will be willing to receive. It's almost like, yeah, I know you can do it, Lord. I'm not sure we can. And God changes his message to Ezekiel again because at the call narrative, when he was first speaking into Ezekiel's life, he says, I need you to proclaim. I need you to proclaim even if no one is listening. I need you to understand you might speak the truth into the world and nobody pays any attention. But now his message changed. He says, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy. We, we usually think of prophecy as uh, foretelling the future. But in the biblical sense, prophecy is about speaking the truth of God into the present situation. Ezekiel, I want you to speak truth. I want you to speak truth, God says, and I will revive the people. I want you to speak truth. <laughs> 
and my people will be filled with the Holy Spirit again. I want you to speak truth and the temple will be rebuilt. I want you to speak truth and the priesthood will be restored. I want you to speak truth and my glory will descend upon my people and I'll live with you again just as I did in the days you remember. I want you to speak truth, Ezekiel. And out of the rebuilt temple will flow streams of living water, a river that grows deeper as it moves out into the countryside and that causes life to spring up around it wherever it goes, that even though it flows to the lowest point on the planet, even though it flows into the Dead Sea, even there it will bring life. Ezekiel, I want you to speak truth to my people. I want to restore them so that they can be a source of life to the world around them. I want you to speak truth because this is the best of times and the worst of times. It's a time of darkness, but it's also a time of hope when my spirit enters in. And so Ezekiel does speak. He does. But once again, God calls him to this different way of speaking, uh, this sort of symbolic action, this way of, he, he, he tells them, I want you to take two sticks and I want you to bind them together. And when people ask, tell them, it's, there are no longer two kingdoms. There is one king that, that belongs to the Lord and there is one king that rules over it for all time. It's this business of not just speaking words, but speaking through actions that reminds me of a quote that was attributed to Martin Luther when he said, Speak the gospel always and use words when necessary. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times for Ezekiel, for Dickens, for the people on the end of the Enlightenment, the beginning of the French Revolution. It's the best of times and the worst of times in the um, early fourth century of Christianity. Uh, the Emperor Diocletian was on the throne in Rome and he was the most systematic in terms of persecuting Christians. Uh, there had always been a sort of a hatred of Christians and a, a, um, a tendency to blame them for whatever was going wrong in the world. But Diocletian is the emperor uh, of which most of the stories are told where Christians are arrested and fed to lions and, and uh, placed before gladiators and burned at the stakes. The, the, this is the reign of Diocletian. It's a dark time of persecution for the church. But it's also a moment in which they are on the verge of breaking forth into the world in a tremendous new way. Most historians will tell you that this took place because of uh, Emperor Constantine. Um, when he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, and, and that was a big moment. You know, from there Christianity could spread into the rest of the world with, with official sanction. And yet, more and more historians today are beginning to recognize that uh, Emperor Constantine was, he, he was sort of jumping on a bandwagon that was already up and rolling and that the real breakthrough for Christianity in terms of reaching the masses had happened about 50 years earlier. Oddly, during a time when they were being persecuted and during a time of plague. Uh, we call it the plague of Cyprian today uh, because of the early Christian saint who preached about it and told about uh, how awful it was and how Christians moved through it with such courage. But the most telling remarks come from the enemies of Christianity, um, these uh, ensigns of the emperor who are sending messages back and forth about what they've witnessed because during this plague, people were dying in the cities at a phenomenal rate. Uh, one account says that uh, at the peak of the plague, 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome alone. And, and, and while there was a lot they didn't understand about medicine in those days, they did see, yes, this seems to be worse in the cities than it is in the country. And so many rich and prominent people fled the cities 
leaving the poor behind to fend for themselves. And, and among these powerful people uh, were many of the priests of the pagan temples. And, and the ensigns of Rome were writing back to the emperor and to their generals and to their governors and their prelates. And they were saying, you know, when our priests left the people to suffer and starve in the streets, the Christians were coming into the city to minister love and care. And early Christianity gained in popularity among the poor, among the soldiers, in a way that could have never happened. This was the best of times and the worst of times. For Christians who chose to preach truth using words if necessary. So, a few days ago, um, I heard a rustling in the laundry room. I, I knew what it was immediately because we have this problem uh, every year. Um, the, uh, the dryer has a vent that uh, goes out the side of the house. It goes through the laundry room wall directly to the outdoors and on the outside of the house, as most of you have, there's a little hooded cover for that vent that directs the air uh, down. And every year uh, we have birds that try to uh, build a nest in that uh, vent. Now I, I've put um, chicken wire over it in a sort of a little uh, uh, cage to keep the birds out, but you know, over the course of the winter, it, it uh, sags or falls loose, or maybe the birds themselves pull it away, I don't know, but every year there are some birds that try to build a nest there in that dryer vent, and you know, it's a... So I uh, left the house and uh, walked around to the side of the house where, um, where that hooded dryer vent was to fix the uh, wires back to the wall. And I was greeted by this astounding sight. We have azalea bushes planted there uh, underneath the dryer vent. And they were in full bloom. I mean, I have not seen them like this in the years that we've lived in the house. We've had several years of late freezes, you know, when things just have not bloomed. And now they are gorgeous. And I got to looking around the rest of the yard and we've got a cherry tree that's getting ready to blossom. And, another uh, weeping cherry that's not far behind it. And there are things that are already blooming and things that are budding. It's funny because the, the next day I went in to the office um, uh, and, and we had a Zoom meeting of the staff and uh, Jonathan Klebinger had had the same sort of experience that I had had and he said it like this. He said, I went outside and I saw all the flowers blooming and it surprised me because I thought with the coronavirus, everything had been called off. And, and for both of us, it was this moment of remembrance that with all that we're moving through right now, um, you know, God is still at work. The world is still turning. Life still comes forth. It's not exactly a, a valley of dry bones, but for me it was a moment in which I felt God reassure me that, you know, He is the bringer of life. He's the bringer of hope. He, he displays it to us in the parable of the seasons every year. This is the best of times and it's the worst of times. It's a, it's a dark and frightening and scary time we live in, and yet at the same time, God continues to speak and continues to call His people forward and say, preach the good news, and I will restore, preach the good news, and I'll send my spirit, preach the good news, and together we will pour out life on this world. Preach the good news use words as necessary.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let God's people say. Amen. In the fall there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will still be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it sees none, something God alone In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection at the last of victory, unrevealed. Until it sees how something